We are going to be in the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4 is where, we're going to be, where we are going to be starting. And it's a little odd. We're starting midway through the book this morning. Ephesians is six chapters, and Ephesians 4 is, is Ephesians 4, 1 is quite literally at the exact halfway mark. So I wanted to do a little bit of a recap as we get into this morning. See, it's an important break that Ephesians has, right, in Ephesians chapter 4. In many ways, Ephesians is kind of two very distinct sections that are somewhat separate from each other. The first half of Ephesians, Ephesians 1 through 3, is very much focused on the riches that we have in Christ. Paul is talking very distinctly, this is who God is. This is what God has done for you at the beginning of Ephesians. And then, starting at chapter 4, he switches gears almost entirely. The word riches pops up a, a, a dozen times in those first three chapters. And then to my knowledge, it doesn't pop up again. Instead, the core theme of 4 through 6 is, now you need to be walking. You've been given these riches, now you need to be walking in what God has done. And so we're going to begin today with the second half. Well, what are we supposed to do now that we know about these riches that God has given to us? All of Paul's letters usually contain kind of a beautiful example between doctrine and then application. And it's Ephesians that I think is the most clean of all of those, of very, very distinctly being doctrine followed by that application. So his first three chapters are doctrine. The core theme is all about this is what Christ has done for you. But that's not really going to be the main theme anymore. No, the theme is going to be, now here's what you should be doing. Here's how you can be walking. And today, we're going to be talking about the theme of walking in unity. Walking in unity with one another. And so Paul is going to give us some application. He wants us to see the meaning behind all of this doctrine. He's laid the foundation. So now, let's get into the application. And he's going to therefore urge his readers... Some translators say he's going to beseech them, to challenge them. He's basically going to spend the first three chapters saying, God has blessed you, not God will bless you if you do these things. No, it's God has blessed you, therefore I urge you, do as you are supposed to. Do as you are commanded. We have been given a marvelous calling in Christ, and it is now our responsibility to live up to that calling. So, today we're going to be talking about walking in unity. It's a pretty simple concept. That theme of unity is also going to talk a lot about maturity, that practical application of how can we be unified as a church. It talks a lot about how can we be growing up? How can we be being more mature and responsible Christians? God has built his temple, his body of believers, and it's now our responsibility to protect it, to preserve it, and to grow that body of believers. So let's read and then we'll pray. Ephesians 4, 1 through 16 says this, Therefore I, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to that one hope that all belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things." And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, until, all, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is, head, who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Let's pray this morning. 
Dear Father God, I thank you for this passage, Lord. I thank you just for all of the wisdom that you have given to us about what it means to be a unified church, what it means to be a unified universal church, Lord, what it means to be mature, what it means to be growing, and what it means that uh, we can be Christians that are a light to this world, Lord, that are evangelists, that are preachers, Lord. I pray these things in your name. Amen. All right, so I kind of already established Ephesians is divided into two halves. And we're going to start, and our entire first point is really just going to be about that first word, therefore. Because again, if it's divided into two halves, and they are distinct halves, there's still a reason he started with all of this theology, with all of this richness. Before we get into why he's going to be talking about unity, why he's going to be talking about growth, we need this therefore. So let's kind of quickly cover what came before. Because clearly, we're continuing off a previous thought. And that thought is all about kind of, in my mind, motivation. Why does he do theology first into application? If chapters 4, 5, and 6 are all about, here's what you are supposed to do, why does he take so long to get there? Well, we need to know the motivation for why we are supposed to have the right application. The reason I think a lot of Christians have a hard time living out their Christian faith is because they they want the faith, but they want to start their faith with the rules. If I can just follow what God has given to me, my faith will be good. But the way that Ephesians is basically structured says that's not the case. No. It's not starting with the rules, starting with the list of do's and don'ts. It's instead, you're supposed to start your motivation on, here's what Christ has given to you. Here's what God has richly poured out on you. And if you live your faith as merely a list of do's and don'ts, as a list of rules, jumping straight into chapter 4, 5, and 6, you're going to kind of miss the core of, well, here's what our faith is built on. Not what we do, but what Christ has done for us. And Paul knows this. It's why he starts Ephesians not off with application, but with, with this doctrine. He establishes, this is who God is. This is how he is amazing. This is how he loves us. How he has poured out his riches, richness onto us. He has sealed us. He has chosen us. He has redeemed us. Therefore, we should be motivated to properly follow his rules. Let me illustrate that in a practical way. Our food comes with nutrition labels right on it. We can see it pretty clearly. The government has been packaging items like this for a long time in the hopes that if we show the percentages and if they show the calories, maybe, just maybe, the people will be motivated to eat a little healthier. We as Americans, we're pretty fat, right? Now, I don't think that's a good motivator, but it is a motivator. The only time when I actually started to look at that nutritional facts was not because, oh, I need to do what the government wants for me. No, it was because I was in my 20s, I was still single, and I realized maybe if I eat a little healthier, maybe if I go to the gym, just maybe I cannot be single. That motivation was a lot bigger, a lot better than anything the government was trying to put on those packages. Both motivations are acceptable, but not are equal, if you kind of catch my drift. In the same way, we have like the speed limit, right? That speed limit is supposed to motivate us. Hey, follow the rules. Do what you are expected. But the reason I, I drive the speed limit has a lot less to do with, well, I want to obey the government, and more, my kid's in the car. I've got a wife. I need to be responsible. And so it's the right motivation that leads us to doing certain things. We can all be following what I'm going to be talking about today. All of us can be doing it, but if we're doing it from the wrong motivation, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't apply itself in the right way. And so Paul, he's going to be giving plenty of rules, plenty of things that we are supposed to be doing. But we need to, as we get into those things, remember what our main motivation is. Our main motivation is God has already saved us. He already has done this. He already loves us. Now, out of a love that we have back towards him, here is how we are supposed to respond. Not so that we can get his love, not so that we can be the Christian's that we think we're supposed to be. No, we are doing it purely out of what we are doing or what God has done for us. And this is something we should be doing all the time. Practice this. Next time you're motivated to sin, think, what has God done for me? Not what rules am I supposed to follow? 
Not what, what list of rules in the Bible does it say I need to do to be, to be right? It's no. What has Christ done on the cross for me? How has God shown me love? That will go a lot longer in your walk with Christ. So that's the basis of our main theme as we dive into unity. Where is your motivation as you are seeking to do these things? Next, the grace for unity. In verses 1 through 3, Paul writes that we are to maintain unity. And to do that, Paul lists seven manners of grace that we must possess, that we must walk in. So let's get to some of those rules, some of those things we're expected to do. We are to be humble, gentle, patient, bear with one another, eager, and peaceable. Basically, unity, if we want to be a unified church, it starts with fixing ourselves. It starts with being people that other people want to be around. I'm going to throw this kid under the bus, but it's been many years. In high school, I foolishly decided to join the baseball team uh, in, a ju as a junior. I hadn't played baseball in like seven years, but I decided I want to sit bench this year. Let's go. And sure enough, I did. And on the team, there was another kid named uh, Donnie. And Donnie was unfriendly, to say the least. Donnie was exactly the opposite of the list of things we just described. Kind of towards everybody, not just towards me, towards everybody. The kind of person that nobody wanted to be around. And for those that were good at baseball, they got to be on the field and kind of escape him. But for the bench warmers, for me, who had to spend time with this guy, it just meant that everybody was miserable. Just being present with this obnoxious high schooler, as many high schoolers can be, was a tough time. And so maybe you've heard the expression, hurt people hurt people. That those of us that are struggling cause pain for others. That may have been the case for this kid. That may be the case for a lot of us. Often people are going through bad things at home. They have a tough life. Yes, hurt people do choose to hurt others. But, but God's word is constantly talking about how can we not, how can we be growing? Not using our pain to just bring it out, rip it against others. No, maturity is working through your sin nature, working through what has been done to you, and choosing to grow from it, not as an excuse for poor behavior. We should be desiring to be people who are always growing, who others want to be around. And so unity starts with how can we be people that others want to be in unity with, want to be in fellowship with. Paul's emphasis is that unity. And it will only come about when we strive to keep it, when we, as verse 3 says, strive to maintain it. God creates unity in the church through his, his spirit, but it is now our responsibility to recognize that and then to keep it. Paul's going to say something incredibly similar in the book of Romans. In Romans 15, 5 through 7, he says this, May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. So that's very similar language to what we see. The idea of unity is, is something we have to be working on so that we can be welcoming. It is amazing, providential, what God has done through his spirit in our lives. Yet still, we have to work on it every day to overcome our flesh, to be people that in spite of our sin nature, in spite of our failings, can still be used by God, can be sanctified by God. You may know or have, were at a church previously that was a, a church split. Maybe the church that you used to go to doesn't even exist anymore because it split and just disintegrated. It takes a lot of work to keep a church together. Instead of working on maintaining unity, some churches just really struggle, don't want to be these things. Something we as a church pray about, talk about, focus on, is keeping unity at the forefront. We've worked hard, and we have to work hard, because the enemy loves it for the church to be fighting amongst itself, for enmity to be stirred up for division, for strife to be coming. Therefore, what can you, as, as a church 
person, as a church member, congregate, what can you be doing to be emphasizing, to be growing that unity? How can you be humble, gentle, patient, selfless, eager, and peaceable as far as it depends on you? How can you be promoting that unity that we are striving as this local church? So, the grounds for unity, the grace for unity, we've got the gist of unity. I was really trying to stick with my G's. But then, in verses 4 through 6, Paul says that unity comes through some core doctrines, and he's going to list those. This is not Paul saying, ignore all other doctrines, only focus on this, only focus on the simple ones. No, Paul just spent three whole chapters pretty dedicated to doctrine. And that wasn't for no reason. Instead, he's saying, while doctrine can differ from church to church, and it certainly does, we should be focusing on these things. There are several things that unite us that are specifically important to every body of Christians, to every community and fellowship of Christians. Firstly, we are one body. This means that the universal church exists, and we are all a part of it. That was something that Pastor Chris talked about just two weeks ago when he guest spoke. Secondly, we have one spirit, the Holy Spirit, who indwells in all believers. We have one hope, the hope, the promise of the return of Christ Jesus to this earth. We have one Lord, Jesus Christ, who was born a man, died on the cross, and rose again conquering death. We have one faith, that is, that while some churches practice church differently, all Christians agree in what makes us a Christian. That if you believe in Jesus and have faith in his act of dying on the cross and resurrecting, you are saved. We have one baptism. This is an important one, because I think our mind immediately goes probably to the literal baptism, and there's a lot of dispute on, is it infant baptism? Is it baptism by dunking? And while that is important, and we as a Baptist church have pretty strong opinions about that, I think in the context of what he's talking about here, this is the spiritual baptism. We have one spiritual baptism. That is the baptism of the Spirit who indwells in us. And then we have one God, the Father. Basically, we are all one family. All churches that follow these core tenets are together. All churches that believe that Jesus is the Christ, if you believe in him, you will be saved. If you have hope in his return. So, let me clarify a term. I know Pastor Chris talked about this, the universal church versus the local church, but I think it's really important to my sermons. So I want to make sure we get this. They mean two different things. The Bible, when we read about the body of believers or the assembly or the church, depending on the context, the authors of the Bible can mean different things. Sometimes the authors are talking about the local church. That is a singular building, just like we are, where we are gathered, like Windsor Christian Church, where people come together to fellowship and to worship God. That is the church. But sometimes the Bible is referring to the universal church. That is not just one church, one building. That is all churches across the world that are all believing in the same thing, that are all praising and professing their faith in Jesus Christ. And so those are the two differences, the local church versus the universal church. So we, as the universal church, are one body, one body that, that believes in the gift of the Holy Spirit, how he guides the church and unifies the church. That church has one hope, the hope we have in the Lord Jesus Christ, one baptism, one spirit, one God. Many of those points are very specific, and we believe that Jesus is not the way, he is the only way. That, they, we, that one God, one faith, one Lord is so important. And that's what we see here. The other core thing that I really think stands out is we see pretty clearly that our faith is one God, yet three persons. We see the Spirit, we see Christ, and we see the Father, all clearly united. So those are kind of the two core tenets that I see in what he's talking about. Faith in Christ alone, and Christ as being three in one. All that to say... We absolutely should have good doctrine. Yes. As the local church, we should absolutely care about the minutia of the Bible. We should study it in its context. Try to understand differences. Try to understand all of the rules that God has for us. Yet, as a universal church, we should respect that some people do church very differently than us. And so, we should find ways to unify with them as part of the universal church. How? How? I think that comes a little later. We're going to get into almost the exact opposite point as we get towards 
uh, the end, chapter or 4, verse 15, when Paul says we are to speak the truth in love. So we cannot be Christians that believe in peace at any price. We should find a balance of protecting doctrine while also being Christians who other Christians can get along with. There are a lot of differences in the body of Christ. Even now, you guys probably showed up this morning thinking, can't wait to hear Pastor Lance. This is going to be great. And then I walked up, ugh, yikes. We all have our differences. Hopefully, I'm not too jarring of a difference. But there are certainly differences. Maybe you've been to another church in town. Maybe they preach even more differently than Lance and I. Maybe their music is nothing like what Steve does. Maybe it's all hymns or it's a rock concert. There are a number of different ways that we can be doing church. And it can be very different than us, but that doesn't necessarily make it wrong. I would love to say we're the perfect church. We've got it all figured out. This is the way church should be done, but it's not. All churches can do things very differently. And my fear is that we as a church are too judgmental of other churches, other churches even in town. That instead of being united, we look down on other Christians, on other churches, and they're, ah, they're doing it wrong. That's not the way I would do it. Instead of being united as God calls us to be. When I went to India, I got to go to a few church services. And it was absolutely strange, no question about it. Some of the customs they had just didn't seem right. The, the, uh, the, for instance, the whole service, all the elders and the special guests sat not in the congregation. They sat directly behind the preacher. A little intimidating, looking out at the crowd, kind of judging you if you got on your phone. Can you imagine Red up here just staring you down the whole time? It's not what I would want. There were also a separation between men and women. Even if you were married, women sat on one side, men sat on the other. Uh... The music was probably the most jarring when I kind of asked for a translation. What are we singing? We here in America sing pretty traditional songs. How great is our God? God is amazing. Stuff like that, where we're really praising God. I asked for the lyrics of what are we singing? Ah, uh, well, something about how we're going to war against Satan. We're going to slay the devil. Goodness, we, we don't sing like that here at Windsor Christian. And there were many, many more oddities. Some that I can't really even verbalize. Just ugh, kind of made me tingle, right? But I do know... Those were my brothers and sisters in Christ. Those people were worshiping the same God. And on the subject that unified us most, Jesus, we were in agreement. And that's what mattered. So, verses 1 through 6 talk about what all Christians have in common. Then, 7 through 11 is going to kind of take a little tangent. And he's going to talk about the gifts that Christ has given to all of us. Paul, quote, Paul quotes from the Psalms in verse 8 and talks about how Christ has both ascended and descended for our good and for our gifts. And I heard a number of preachers kind of spend a, a large portion of their sermon talking about this. I'm going to kind of zoom through these few verses, 7 through 11. But there are two main points that I want to get through to clarify what he's talking about here. Firstly, in this section, he says that Christ's desire is that he might fill all things, that he is the supreme being over all powers, both in heaven and on earth. There's nothing under him. Both Jesus ascending and, de ascending and descending makes clear this purpose. He did not descend and somehow lose who he was, nor did he ascend and regain it. In coming, he did this that he might fill all things. And secondly, we are to realize that the ascending and descending Lord, the one that we worship now, is the same one who lived with us, who shared our sorrows, our trials, our temptations, and he feels the same things we feel. He fills all things and he feels all things. So that's kind of the brief tangent. We're going to move straight kind of in to verse 12 here. Then that God who is with us, who's with each and every believer, has given some spiritual gifts. And Paul writes regularly about spiritual gifts. When Steve, I believe when Steve last preached, he loves to preach on spiritual gifts. This is his big passion. And so there are a number of different books that talk about the spiritual gifts, that give long lists. Corinthians, Romans, they're going to give lists of here are the things that God, the Holy Spirit, gives you when you become a Christian. And Ephesians, he's going to give a list, but this is by no means a comprehensive list. No, instead, it's not so much the list that matters as which gifts he decides to describe. So, in order to maintain unity, 
it's going to take maturity. And starting in verse 12, we read about the spiritual gifts that Jesus gives us to maintain this unity. Again, it's not exhaustive, but instead it's focused on here are the leadership requirements needed for the church leaders so that the church can be unified. Let me reread 11 through 13. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now, we just read kind of five different spiritual gifts that he gives. But in the Greek, those last two, the preacher teacher, the shepherd teacher, those are kind of combined into one. So it's really only four. We have apostles, you have prophets, evangelists, and teachers. So let's kind of break those down as we just read them. Firstly, we have some that are given the gift of being apostles. So that word apostle means someone who has been sent with a commission. Jesus had many disciples, many followers, but we hold the select apostles in a higher regard because Jesus divinely appointed some people his, to do specific purposes. And we believe here at this church in a strict sense, there aren't really apostles today in the same way there were back then. The early church had apostles, people that were given specific, specific commands who had seen Jesus, who had seen the resurrected Lord, and then did his, uh, did his requirements, did what he entrusted of them. And so we view apostles as kind of only those people who helped form the early church. Now, in a looser sense, some might still be kind of a lower capital uh, apostle. Maybe they've been given the gift of church planting. And then, after planting the church, they hand it off. They're more of a visionary who does what they need to do and then moves on in the same way kind of those early church apostles did. They're not really pastors, not really evangelists. I personally would almost be hesitant to even call them apostles. But in some aspect, maybe these, this description still exists. of Kind of visionaries who are not leaders of churches, but who are maybe planters and missionaries of certain churches. Next, Paul writes about prophets. And we typically associate a prophet as somebody who can see the future. That's not really what a prophet is in the Bible. A prophet in the Bible was instead somebody who understands the mysteries of God and then reveals it. And there were many prophets who never once predicted the future, who instead just, here's who God is, and I'm giving it to you. And today, we don't really get our understanding of prophecy from people. We get it through God's word. God's word has given us his mysteries, and when we come to a better understanding of it, we can discern what God has for us. Next, we have evangelists. There are people who are really good at being bearers of the good news, people who travel from place to place sharing the gospel. If the apostles and the prophets kind of laid the foundation of the church, it's the evangelists who took the torch and then carried it until today. And I believe all of us, even if we're not given the gift of evangelism, all of us are supposed to be evangelists. So, going back to India, I've got another picture of this guy. She knew George. I love She knew George. This guy was my, he was my core translator most of the time we were there. And I, I don't know if you guys remember when I gave my update, but by and large, when I went to India to be a missionary, I was like a puppet. I was the fancy little white boy who allowed She knew George to get into these villages and start conversations. And I tried to my best to share the gospel and to do what I needed to do, but it was really she knew my translator who took what I said and ran with it. And it was incredible. I did not know the language, did not know what was being said, but I could just tell being with this man, he was the best evangelist I've ever met. And that's not an exaggeration. It was remarkable just spending time with the guy that all he wanted to do was share Jesus. No matter where we went, no matter where we stopped, he was talking about Christ to somebody. If you've ever chatted with me after church, you'll find pretty quickly, Justin's not really good at small talk. I don't enjoy chatting with this guy. It's understandable. I get it. He, the exact opposite. My goodness, this guy could talk to anybody about anything and then turn it to Christ. And when I look at Shinu, I recognize there are people that are given an extraordinary gift to share the gospel. 
to be evangelists. So then lastly, we have what I do believe I am, which is a preacher and teacher. A preacher and teacher, a pastor. Their job is to shepherd the church, the local church, to make sure that God's people are growing. And the Bible has a lot of descriptions, rules for pastors. Pastors are supposed to be preaching the word, be diligent. Pastors and teachers will be judged more harshly for what they say. They're supposed to constantly be giving the true, pure doctrine. And that's really important that your pastors, that the church that you go at, is a church that is going to be growing you, is a church that is going to be speaking the truths that God has already imparted to his people. So all of these roles are the roles for leadership in the church. And specifically, these were the roles, as I see it, for the church to grow. All of these roles were there so that the church could grow. Healthy sheep reproduce. And in the same way, a healthy leadership grows the church. If the church is to grow, not just spiritually, but numerically, where I think we are talking about numbers here, it takes unity in the church. It takes the leadership doing what is right, and then the congregation following through with that. I don't know if you've ever thought through this, but it's really not Lance's job to be sharing the gospel to the people of Windsor. It is Lance's job to be shepherding and equipping you guys to then be going and sharing the gospel with the people of Windsor. In order for this church to truly grow, we need leaders who are doing the right thing, equipping the saints. And then what we see here in these verses is then we need the saints to be going and equipping other people for the purpose of building up the body of Christ. Which leads me to my final point, the growth for unity. We read in 12 through 16 about the practical application of these gifts. That the reason the Holy Spirit gives the gifts is so that the church can grow, both in numbers and in maturity. Leaders are called to equip the saints, and saints are called to equip others. And then we see in verse 14 that Christians are not supposed to stay babies. This this verse here in Ephesians Ephesians 4, 14 is one of my favorites. We in kids' church actually sing a song that we're no longer babies, tossed to and fro, and I've got them doing the whole hand motions. And so the kids, if you ask any of your kids that go to kids' church, do you know this verse? They're going to know it. So we sing this a lot. It's one of my favorites. That we, and what it says is that we are not supposed to stay immature. No. Christians are supposed to stand up for themselves, to be mature in their own right. It is not the job of the pastor to be the arbiter of truth, to be the one guy that knows everything, that has all the wisdom, while you guys are just walking around blind. It is the job of every believer, this says, to be able to identify lies, to know the difference between fact and fiction, to be equipped to go into the world with what you know from God's word, with what you know from learning at church, and then apply it in your everyday life. So this is kind of a hard story for me to share, so I'm going to try to talk about this delicately. Herein lies the difficulty with unity. See, well, at the beginning of my sermon, I emphasized pretty heavily we need to be striving to be at peace with all churches. At the same time, we need to be striving to be people who are growing in God's word. And to be growing in God's word means to be, each and every day, having a better understanding of theology, being better equipped, better knowing the difference between right and wrong, better knowing God's wisdom versus man's lies, to be more sanctified at all times in your walk with Christ. And I I firmly believe some churches are not doing a good job of preaching that. Absolutely not. I was working at a church here before Windsor Christian where I felt like I was kind of alone studying the Bible. I was going to seminary at the time, and I was looking around at a lot of the people, people I was on staff with, people who were longstanding members, who were just baby Christians. And they wanted to stay that way, growing, not learning, where that was an acceptable culture I remember really just feeling like I'm doing my job, I'm going to seminary, and it was just heartbreaking to turn and see that no one had a strong biblical understanding, that that wasn't what was emphasized from the leadership, and that was not what was applied by any of the congregation. Instead, it was just kind of church basics. Hey, believe in Jesus, have faith, have faith, have faith, and you'll be saved. Without ever really a desire to kind of take it to the next level, to be people who are growing, no longer babies. After two years, I was there for three years, after two years of primarily teaching to kids, 
I had the opportunity to teach my own Bible class, to kind of take what I thought the people needed to hear and really, really teach it. And what I discovered was honestly kind of shocking to start to have deep theological conversations with these same people I was in community with. And I, I left the church for a number of reasons, but this is going to be the reason I'm going to share today. So I, I was starting this Bible study, and we started, we taught through the book of James, which is really applicable, a lot of practical stuff. Here's what you can go home and do today. And it was a good Bible study. And then we decided to switch to a more theological. Instead of application-based, it was more doctrine-based. And so it was, I talked about what are the names of God? Lesson number one, Jesus says, I am. In the book of John, Jesus uses seven different I am statements. I am the bread of life, the light, the door, the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and I am the true vine. All of these statements are basically kind of saying the same thing. Jesus is the only way to heaven. And as I taught that, there were two men that pushed back on that. Two long-standing church members said, are you sure other people from other religions aren't going to heaven? Are you saying people who believe in other religions are going to hell? No, all religions get you to the same place. That was shocking to me. Next lesson, Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. And so I talked about how Jesus is fully God and fully man. And I got pushed back on that one too. I, Jesus is God, but he wasn't really a man. He was like a spirit. What? It was shocking. And all that to say, some churches don't build up their members. When I, was in ver when I look at verse 14, when I think about these children tossed to and fro by every wave of direction, by every wind of doctrine, that's exactly what was described. That, that, that exactly describes my experience at that church. 1 Corinthians 13, 11 says this, when I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up my childish ways. When I first came to Windsor Christian, the first thing I wanted to do was see if that was true at this church. So I got plugged in to several different young adults, or young adults and just adults groups. I got plugged into Rhett's Young Adults Group to Eric Strom's Bible study in the, on Sunday mornings. And what I saw was that people of all ages were desiring to grow. People were here with a desire to learn. And seriously, if you're not plugged into a small group, I implore you, do that. Go. See that our church is healthy, that you're surrounded, hopefully, by a majority of people that are here with the desire to be sanctified, to be growing in Christ. And that was what I got to see. It was amazing. I was at seminary and I was looking around and some people were average churchgoers. I'm not saying everybody was a genius, but there were some people that were not seminary trained, not going to school professionally for this, that knew more than I did. And that was kind of, it was a relief to know I'm not alone here with a desire to learn who God is, with a desire for that theology. So, even though some of you may be new to the faith, some of you may be experienced, been coming to the church for a very long time, Hopefully, we are all doing what Ephesians is asking. Showing up to church faithfully, diligently, with the desire to be changed men and women. That's all we can really ask from this text, at least for this point. And so, we are inevitably, as a result of that, I think, going to clash. If church people are going, desiring to uphold true doctrine, that means at times, some of us are going to read things and come to difficult conclusions, come to different conclusions. The Bible can be sticky on some of these secondary issues. And that is okay. Let's reread verses 15 and 16. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. We're to disagree in love, to speak the truth in love. What, what great practical advice he has for us. That when we disagree, and it's going to come, we can disagree in love. And when we do that, the whole body grows. Awesome. So, what are we supposed to take away from this? How can we apply this to our lives? Well, I had five main points. I kind of just want to go over them again and give you guys some application. What can we be doing with what God has given to us this morning? Well, firstly, our motivation for following Christ should come not from a list of rules, but from our love of who God is. That's huge. 
as we reach our final point, I think it's really good that we go back and revisit how I started. Because just like Paul does, as we get further into this passage, the rules start popping out. And I want to reemphasize that first point. What matters most out of everything is that our motivation is right. We're not doing this to be legalists. We're not doing this to be people that just, oh, I've got to do what God says because that's, you know, trying to just follow all the rules. No, we're doing it because we, out of an overflow of love for God, seek and desire to do it. Yes, we should still strive to follow God's commands. We should still uphold good doctrine, but our worship should come primarily from who he is, not from the rules or the guidelines he's given us. Secondly, fix yourself. How can you be somebody who's humble, gentle, patient, loving and peaceable? Somebody who's easily, easel, somebody who is able to be easily gotten along with. This whole passage is on unity, so be somebody who can walk the walk that he has presented for us. Thirdly, be unified with other churches. Yes, it's going to be sticky. How can we be unified with churches that are so different, that take such a different approach? What should we do when it's that battle between upholding good doctrine versus just being friendly with other people we're going to see one day again in heaven? Honestly, it's a balancing act. It's one I'm not sure I've quite figured out. Even in this very lesson, I, I, I'm not really sure what to do with it. And I see that. So I do not by any means think we should blindly accept all strains of Christianity. But instead, we should recognize there are people that come from a different strain who have the same faith as us, that will be people that we will see again in heaven. They are people that Christ has called us to be unified with, as Romans 12, 18 says, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. So instead of focusing on the ways people worship differently or teach differently, we should seek to be speaking lovingly, recognizing that they are part of the body of Christ. Fourth, all of us are called to be evangelists. Jesus, in his final words to his disciples, said in Matthew, 18, 19 through 20, Matthew 28, 19 through 20, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. That is the Great Commission. We are called to follow it, to teach others, to be growing others, that we can be a church that is sharing what we know and what we learn with the community, with those around us. And finally, be a church that is unified in your desire to grow together. In youth group and in kids' church, we always, we do our lesson, we also get to do small groups, which is just great. That it's not just me talking, it's the kids talking with one another. And when kids are goofing off during the lesson, every now and then, you'll see other kids correct them. Hey, let's focus. We're here to learn. It's amazing. It's like, it's like it warms my heart as the youth guy when you get to see that happen. When they call each other out in love, hey, we are here to grow. Get off your phone. Stop dozing off. Sometimes I get to, go, I get to join the high school boys group, small group, and when they're really paying attention, it's like I'm not even there. They are leading the discussion of what they've learned and chatting with one another so that all of them can be united and can be growing together. Because our faith is communal. And so how can you be doing that here? How can you be doing that at Windsor Christian? The same is true here. Church doesn't just happen on Sundays. It doesn't just happen with Lance preaching. You hear something, you go away. No, it happens every day when we as a body come together, when we work together to be growing one another, to be challenging one another, to be checking in with one another. So let's pray as we conclude this morning. Dear God, I thank you for today. I pray that our church can be a church that is unified, unified in their desire to be growing in you, Lord. We are so thankful for our Sunday, for our ability to be worshiping you. We're thankful for the many ways that we can worship you. We're thankful for the many churches that are out there preaching your word. And we pray that we can be yet another church that is in the body of you, Lord, that is teaching what you have for us in accordance with your word. I pray these things in your son's name. Amen.